This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York. That means it's 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. We might not be done just yet. That's the message from the Fed as the minutes show that many on the FOMC still see the battle with inflation as far from over. In response, global bond yields march to 15-year highs. Norway's central bank this morning hiking by another 25 basis points and warning that it may need to do more. And the cracks in China widen. Beijing ramping up efforts to stem losses in the yuan as alarm bells ring in the country's property and shadow banking sectors. Keep an eye on that story. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson. I'm in for Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta, of course, in New York. Kriti, this week started off as brutally boring. It is anything but now. We have so much going on. I think some really interesting trends developing right now, particularly in the bond market. Yeah, and I would argue in the equity market as well, because, of course, we have hit that 5% retracement you've seen in the S&P 500. And the immediate reaction is a bounce back, at least in futures trading. You are seeing green on the screen. Take a look at it. 44.26 on those contracts, higher by one-tenth of 1%. Now, look, that doesn't exactly signify a ton of conviction in either direction. But it's worth noting there is a little bit of outperformance in those NASDAQ futures, a little bit of tech outperformance from the get-go here. And I think a lot of that speaks to what you saw in the Asian session. I'm going to jump over the bond market. We'll circle back in just a second. But if you saw another sell-off basically in the Asia uh, session both in Japan in uh, China and of course in Hong Kong as well the one outperformer was the CSI 300 of course the Shenzhen 300 index which does have that tech exposure was higher by three tenths of one percent and guy I think that might just be flooding into some of the sentiment you are seeing stateside we'll talk about Europe in just a moment going back to the bond market though there is a very real read through again all those FOMC minutes kind of hopping against I think uh, Neil Kashkari's camp yesterday we asked the question Neil Kashkari saying rate hikes may not be over. Do people agree? Well, the FOMC minutes say, well, maybe not so much. The bond market, nevertheless, uh, selling off a bit higher by four basis points on the 10-year yield, 429 on those notes. Of course, our commodity check is a must. And NYMEX crude trading below the $80 a barrel handle. That is an important level for anyone watching for that kind of resiliency in the oil uh, demand space. 79 higher by two-tenths of 1%, Guy. I've got lots to talk about, so let's dig into it and talk about what is happening here in Europe. I think it's a really exciting session today. There's so much going on. Stock 600 doesn't look like much, but this is really important what is happening here right now. 453, spot 66. 453.43, I think, is the 200-day moving average. We've been below it. Are we going to close below it? I think is really critical. We're down by 1.62 points. Now, around 50 of those points, 40 to 50 of those points, are coming from Aden. This is the giant uh, digital payments business that comes out of Amsterdam. This is a company you really want to pay attention to. It does digital payments for McDonald's, for Hennes and Mauritz, for Uber, for Spotify. This is a company that is plugged in to some of the world's biggest consumer companies. And what it tells you, therefore, about what's happening with the consumer is important. Now, it's hiring aggressively at the moment. That's hitting margins. That's why we're seeing the losses today coming through. They think that's going to come to an end. They're also talking about their customers, which is fascinating. They're talking about their big customers. And I just gave you some of the names. And what those customers are saying is, we are focusing on profitability, i.e. we're not focusing on growth, top line. We're focusing on the middle and the profitability lines that we need uh, and the profitability at the bottom that we need to focus on. And that's fascinating because we're waiting for Walmart today. We are and that could have a really big impact later on in the session. Euro Noki, absolutely flat right now. But again, there's some action here. We've seen the Norge Bank this morning out raising rates by 25 bips. We're up to 4%. That was expected. But the message is clear, Critty. We are not done yet. And they're pointing to further rate rises later this year. And again, perhaps feeding into the bond market story, because, Guy, as you mentioned, it, global yields basically around the world surging to the highest levels since 2008. This comes after resilient economic data. And, of course, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers on the back of that warning that the recent rum up in those 10 year yields may still have a little bit further to go. Take a listen. If you take two and a half and uh, for inflation, you take one and a half, which isn't especially aggressive for uh, real rates, and you take 75 basis points, which is lower than history, for uh, term premiums, you're looking at 475 on uh, the 10-year, and it obviously could end up being higher than that. So nobody knows, but it seems to me we're in a 
very different era than the era we were in in the aftermath of uh, the financial crisis. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel and Bloomberg Markets editor Phil Serafino joins us now. Valerie, I'm going to start with you on this bond story. Look, he's saying that the 10-year yield could hit 475. We are still a, a, a while away from that, 429 on the 10-year yield this morning. This doesn't make sense to me. If the market is pricing in some sort of ending to the rate cycle, this easing perhaps uh, further down the road, 2024, 2025, what is the tailwind here for yields? Oh, Critty, there's a lot going on in the bond market at the moment, and there is a big discussion on what's going to lead uh, the next jump higher in yields, as you just asked me. Uh, there, the one camp out there who is really focused on the supply and dy demand dynamics uh, for Treasuries sees that comment from the Fed minutes yesterday that QT could continue even though the Fed cuts rates. That means we really have to consider the possibility we get a recession and we don't get a mammoth QE program. Program alongside it. What does that mean, Critty? It means that these yields in the long end could stay elevated even though we enter a recession. And there's other things going on here. If we enter a recession, the deficit expands. Uh, borrowing from the Treasury will increase. The supply into the market will increase. And this comes at a time where we are seeing foreign buyers step away. China is reducing their Treasury holdings. Even Saudi Arabia, in the latest tick data, their holdings of U.S. Treasuries hit a six year low. So who is going to absorb all this extra Treasury supply? Regardless of the growth dynamics out there, the Treasury supply is increasing and very much a question out there on who is going to be there to buy it. Oh, well, that's me. So I Phil? was expecting Guy to hop right yeah. in. I figured but, bonds were no, your I, I arena. I think it's you. <laughs> I'm pretty certain it's you. But, uh, but I'm, I, I'll take it if you want. Phil, if that's the case, what does it mean for equities? Equities aren't priced for that right now. No, they're not. The equity market has been incredibly complacent this year. Um, you look at uh, the performance this month, the S&P 500 is down. This will be the first down month since February. The market has just been marching steadily and slowly higher because uh, people expected that it was going to be the best of all possible worlds. The Fed was almost done. And hey, maybe they'll start cutting rates late this year, early next year. Now that's off the table. And you have the supply issues that Valerie mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of treasuries coming to market. Um, so the market is is relatedly pricing in the fact that rates may not be coming down as soon as people think. And, you know, the S&P 500, I think, is down 4 percent for the month. Not a huge number, but you annual, annualize that, and that's a, pretty, uh, that's a pretty rapid rate of decline. So the market is, is belatedly coming around to this, this higher for longer scenario on interest rates. Phil, it feels like Valerie was just making the, the kind of commentary that essentially the market plumbing matters for the bond market perhaps more than the fundamentals do, and she can correct me if I'm wrong in that. But talk to us a little bit about the equity market here. She sent out a fantastic chart this morning basically illustrating that the S&P 500 is hitting that 5% retracement. Pretty normal in a normal year. Expected to have 2 or 3% of those kind of mini corrections. But we haven't actually seen that until just now. Is that a problem for the equity market, or is this just kind of uh, normal? Well, I think there is a problem in that the market, as I said, has been very complacent. Investors have been looking at the best of all possible worlds and everything from earnings to interest rates, the Fed. Um, so, you know, technically the market has been there's a lot of optimism built in. And when things go too far one way, the reaction in the other direction can yep. turn out to be to be pretty swift. So I think that's um, I think that's an issue for the market. Valerie wants to talk about the R star, which is usually something we leave for the surveillance crew. They'll get excited about it a little bit later on, but I'll bite. I'll bite. We'll talk about it. Talk to me about the, the R star could be going higher. So this is the kind of the neutral rate where you don't get inflation, but, but you need to think about that number potentially creeping higher at the moment. There's a whole load of demographic forces coming into play. There's all kinds of factors coming into play mm -hmm. which could push this whatever it is R star number a little bit higher. And that, in theory, should keep rates higher as well. But it could be bad for equities, too. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think, you know, we, we're still drunk on this dream that we're going to return to zero interest rates at some point. Yeah. And that clearly is not the case. If you look at what the euro dollar curve is pricing, uh, it has gone from pricing an R star of around 3% to 3.8% yeah. just in the last, you know, few weeks, uh, just in the last uh, month. Yeah. And that is 
something that is going to shake up, uh, you know, a corporate's outlook, a bank's yep. outlook on how they hedge their portfolios. Remember, the banking crisis in March was because banks weren't hedged for, for higher rates. Are they still expecting rates to reduce, rates to retrace, yep. and to have that kind of, um, you know, their unrealized losses, let's say, on their treasury portfolio? I'm just, on the, I'm just on the anything can accurately price our star. Can, can anyone accurately no, price no, no. our you, stuff? You, uh, I, that's, that's where our star is being... I, I, so this, is, this is a nebulous number that I've never really is, got my arms around. When we look at... We can look at the front end of the euro dollar curve, yeah. the front end of the SOFA curve, and it's showing now that the Fed... There's more for the Fed to hike. Uh, cuts are priced in, but where it yeah. levels out in the blue pack, that's four years forward, yeah. it's leveling out at 3.8%, 3.9%. That is a lot higher than where it leveled out a few, a few weeks ago, which was really closer to a three-handle. Valerie, let's talk about some of the other news from around the world this morning, specifically when it comes to the Norges Bank. We saw uh, them talking about potentially raising the rate again in September. I'm really fascinated by, one, what the emerging market kind of uh, central banks are doing, plus the commodity exposed central banks, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, even Mexico, arguably. Are they setting the tone for some of the developed economies? Is this kind of a canary in the coal mine situation? Uh, well, Critty, we can look at a few examples. And clearly, these central banks out there don't want to be punished for turning too dovish too early. That's normally a phenomenon we see more in emerging markets. When central banks in emerging markets try to get too dovish too early, their currency gets demolished, uh, their bond yields uh, spike ever higher. And I think developed markets really now have that scenario on their mind. Take the Bank of England, for instance. They, uh, the gilt market is really punishing them for sounding too dovish too early. And I think other central banks, especially even the Fed, you can throw them into that, don't want to sound uh, the, 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 uh, uh, um, the, the winning bell on inflation uh, too early because they do not want to risk further disruption in the bond markets. Okay, I want to bring something to everybody's attention. It's interesting things happening in the equity market. Well, interesting things happening in the bond market. But let's talk equities for just a moment. Aiden, which is this payments company I mentioned at the top, is now down by 25%. It's been halted. It is 50 points of the 101 points. It's, it's basically, it's 0.5 of the points that are, that the, the stock 600 is down. So the stock 600 is down by 1.63 points. Let's call it 50 of that is coming from Aiden. Phil, this is a, this is a big kind of fintech company that is basically investing heavily in its business. Talk to me about what's happening with Aiden, but talk to me as well about the fact that we are teetering on the 200-day moving average with the stock 600. How significant are both of these two events? Well, I'll tell you what's going on with Adyen is a, a classic example of how growth stocks get punished when they stop growing. Um, fintech has been one area of payments in particular that um, over the past five years, certainly through the pandemic, investors flocked to those stocks because they had these secular tailwinds behind them. Um, you know, digital payments, online payments were a huge, huge um, growth wave. And that's not growing anymore. That's a big problem. And that's why you see a reaction like this down 25%. Um, you know, tech and, and, and digital companies do not have a huge weighting in the stock 600, but this one does have a pretty big weighting. It's gonna push the, in, uh, push the index down taking it to that uh, moving average. And there's a lot of trend followers who look at things like that and say, whoa, the momentum is shifting. Uh, this is clearly a market that is in trouble. And so that's why they're watching that 200-day moving average. Great stuff, guys. Really appreciate it. Fantastic stars setting us up nicely for the day ahead. Valerie Titel, Phil Serafino joining us out of Paris. Uh, bit of breaking news coming out of Spain. This is a critical thing you want to watch as well. Sanchez, the, uh, the Prime Minister, the outgoing Prime Minister, potentially outgoing Prime Minister, uh, winning a vote to name Speaker in a push to remain as Spain's Prime Minister. Very contentious votes, inconclusive, and as a result of which we're into, sort of, into the weeds on this one. Uh, OK, up next, uh, we're going to bring you an exclusive interview with Argentina's leading presidential candidate. I think we were meant to play some sound then, but it says pause for some. I think there's a previous discussion about dollarization. Actually, strictly speaking, it's to get rid of the central bank. The dollarization is an instrumental issue at the end of the day. There are four argumentative axes. One has to do with a moral issue, which is that stealing is wrong. And seniorage is nothing more or less than a swindle by politicians against good people.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London. Kuri Gupta over in New York. Kuri, the front runner in Argentina's presidential race is pledging to close the nation's central bank, but says he'd make every effort to avoid a debt default. In an exclusive interview, he told Bloomberg that his plans include making the US dollar the official currency of Argentina. I think there's a previous discussion about dollarization. Actually, strictly speaking, it's to get rid of the central bank. The dollarization is an instrumental issue at the end of the day. There are four argumentative axes. One has to do with a moral issue, which is that stealing is wrong. And seniorage is nothing more or less than a swindle by politicians against good people. Therefore, let's say, if we consider that stealing is wrong, one of the greatest thieves in the history of mankind is the central bank. The second point has to do with a technical issue because in the Argentine case, it is more evident when a product has no demand, its price is zero. So if the local currency has no demand and its price should be zero, the equilibrium real balances are zero. Whatever amount of money a central bank wishes to impose, the counterpart is that the price level is infinite. Demand and its price should be zero. Equilibrium, real balances are zero. Whatever amount of money a central bank wants to impose, the flip side is that the price level has infinity. And what do you do with the central bank? Would you close it? At one point you made the joke that you were going to set it on fire. Well, what you do with the building is a problem of what you decide to do with it. It's a figure, it's a metaphor. What I'm saying is that the institution doesn't exist anymore. I am saying that in the transition, until you can transform the banking system into a free banking system, it will have to fulfill the function of regulating the banks. The superintendent of financial institutions will continue to operate until a free banking system can be set up. And in that idea, if you are president in six months, ten months, one year, all the bills in circulation in Argentina would be dollars? All dollars, yes. That's interesting. How would that actually work? Could it work? Huge adjustment. Uh, that was an exclusive interview with Argentina's leading presidential candidate, Xavier Milay. Kuri, I, I, think, I think what he's talking about sounds possible on paper. I think the, rea the reality of doing it, in re it on the ground, I think, is a much more complicated process. It sounds straightforward. Yeah, we're just going to use the dollar. Yeah, of course, that's going to work. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of countries would, would like to quickly kind of uh, apply that to, to their way of thinking. But, Guy, currency has really been a, a common topic in, the South, in South America for a while. For a while, yeah. they were considering making kind of a, a euro or their own version of the euro called the SUR yeah. in South America. That was kind of thrown out a years ago as well, but it kind of is making a little bit of a resurgence when it comes to the topics. To me, I think what the most important part of that conversation was, and you can get the full interview, by the way, on, on Bloomberg.com and, and on other social media, Media, is how he would approach China specifically and, and the trade within South America, yep. a lot of which is actually dependent on China. He's not a fan of China, which is interesting. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how that would adjust. Uh, you bring up the euro. The, the, the lesson learned from the adjustment into the euro is that it's very painful for some countries. And getting the rate right going in is really important. And the adjustment is not as straightforward as you think. Anyway, it, it's going to be fascinating to watch whether or not he continues to gain traction. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about next. The wildfires in Maui hitting one regional lender that's already been struggling since the turmoil in the regional banking industry. There's a connection into Hawaiian Electric here that is really worth paying attention to. That story next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Guy Johnson in London. Let's get to some key news developments we're following this hour. A U.S. appeals court has ruled that access to the abortion pill should be preserved with some limits, rejecting part of an order from a judge in Texas that would have effectively banned the sale of the drug across the country. The two to one decision is the latest in a complicated legal saga over mif uh, mifeprestone, I'm gonna get that right, which remains available for women seeking to end their pregnancies under an April order from the U.S. Supreme Court that will stay in effect until the high court rules again on the matter or refuses to hear the case on appeal. So Guy, basically the takeaway here is simply that it's offered, it's available, but now perhaps dealing with a little bit more limitations to expand that kind of uh, coverage. Yeah, I, I, I think the timing of this is going to be really interesting once the, the Supreme Court and the courts kind of 
take this further, we could be well into election territory. And this has been a really tough, this has been a really tough story for the Republicans in particular to navigate, I think. It absolutely has, and that's going to be something, I think, as you point out, the election cycle. But in terms of, I mean, we're going to put a corporate lens on it as well. There is an actual business case to expanding this as well for a lot of the biotech companies that have largely invested in it. Absolutely. Let's talk about something else that we need to focus on as well this morning. The U.S. is preparing to escalate uh, its complaint that Mexico's ban on genetically modified corn violates the nation's free trade deal heightening tension between these two neighbors. The U.S. Trade Representative's office said it plans to request the formation of a dispute resolution panel under the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement today. The corn dispute could make it more difficult for the Biden administration to win Mexico's cooperation on other issues, which, of course, include migration and drug policy critic. Yeah, well, speaking of what the kind of federal government is doing, let's go back to Hawaii and get the update there. Hawaii's biggest utility losing half of its market value in the wake of those deadly wildfires on Maui that might expose it to massive liability costs. The catastrophe adds to financial pressure already weighing on one of its key units. Hawaiian Electric owns and operates American Savings Banks, which has been grappling with this year's turmoil in the regional banking industry. Worse than expected results from the company's banking division, generating about 25% of their operating lead income in Hawaii Electric. A lot going on in the banking industry with that Hawaii Connection guy. More ahead, stick with us. Josie Anderson joins us next. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. We might not be done just yet. That's the message from the Federal Reserve as the minutes show many on the FOMC still see the battle with inflation as far from over. In response, global bond yields marched to 15-year highs. Norway's central bank this morning hiked by another 25 basis points, warning it could do more. And the cracks in China widen. Beijing ramps up efforts to stem losses in the yuan as alarm bells ring in the country's property and shadow banking sectors. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Guy Johnson stepping in for Danny Berger in London. Guy, a lot of cross currents. We talked about this at the top of the show. This yep. bond market getting really interesting, but not necessarily purely because of fundamental reasons. I think there's a whole raft of reasons coming in. Um, maybe not just rate rises. There's all kinds of other dynamics at play here. Deficits, what's happening with Japan, what's happening with the, uh, with the longer term picture in terms of the demographic story. There's all kinds of narratives that are, that are kind of feeding into this one. But what you're getting is a bear steepening. Long end's coming up. That's a really interesting story. I'm going to start with stocks. Let me just talk about what's happening in the stock market. I think this morning's news is really fascinating. So 453.49. We are right on. We are at on the 200-day moving average for the stock 600. We're only down by four-tenths of 1%. A lot of that move is being driven by this stock, Adyen. Um, this is a payments company. It is a digital payments company that serves companies like Uber, Henners and Maurits, McDonald's. It has a, it has a wide portfolio of, of clients and tells you a lot about what is happening in the world. The stock is halted. It, I think it might have just moved, so maybe it isn't halted anymore, but, but it was halted a moment ago because of the declines that we're seeing. It is investing heavily. It is ramping up staffing. The margin is under pressure. These are the kinds of stocks that have moved aggressively. Uh, and looks like it is moving now, so maybe, not, maybe it's just restarted. But it's barely being punched hard today by the news that it's delivered by the, to the market. The market doesn't like what it's hearing. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see whether it changes strategy as a result of this. Back to the bond market. Let's take a quick look at what is happening here. German 10-year picked at random, but obviously it is the benchmark. The Bund is now trading at 2.69. And again, we're selling off. We're up by another four basis points. The yield, the yield in the, in the 10 years, pick your, pick your nation, continues to move higher. It's this bare steepening, Kuri, that I think is fascinating. Well, let's go right there because you said pick your nation. I'll pick the U.S. You're seeing the exact same move. Higher by four basis points on the 10-year year yield stateside. 429 on those notes. And what's interesting is that even as you see yields higher, futures higher as well. And in fact, actually some NASDAQ outperformance. But, Guy, I think a lot of that is a function of what you saw overnight in Asia simply because you did see that sell-off. I think the Chinese index, uh, the Hang Seng now in officially bear market territory, really tells you the exodus of funds you have seen from that region. But a small pocket of green 
seen, and that clearly comes from the CSI 300. So tech outperformance was really the story overnight in Asia as well, amid, again, a sea of red. That index higher by three-tenths of 1%, which I think is flowing into a little bit of the story with the Nasdaq outperformance early on. But again, I emphasize, it is still early on. Anything can happen in the next few hours before those opening bells. A quick check on the commodity sector as well. NYMEX crude trading at a 79 handle. Now look, green on the screen there, higher by two-tenths of 1%, but I think it's significant that uh, basically the U.S. benchmark here is trading below the $80 a barrel handle. How much is supply and demand really the story here, as opposed to perhaps trading in line with the risk sentiment guy? Chris, let's pull it all together. Let's, I want to talk about the central bank story in a little bit more detail, because I think there's a common thread running through all of it. So you've got Fed Minutes message there. Clearly, we may have more work to do. The Norwegian Central Bank this morning actually saying we ha may have more work to, work to do. They've just raised by 25 bips. They're pointing, about, pointing to another rate rise later on in the year. All of the data this, this week out of the, uh, the UK may be pointing to the Bank of England having more work to do. The market's now pricing a terminal rate of around 6%. Again, are central banks confounding the market, the market expectations? Is the market leading the central bank expectation? Let's talk about this a little bit more. Josie Anderson, uh, Managing Economist at the Centre for Economics and Business Research, joining me now on set. The message feels consistent, is it? Central banks around the world saying, we may not be done yet. I think it's true. Yeah, I think certainly looking at the ECB, the Fed and the Bank of England, we're expecting more rate rises from all of them, in fact, actually. Um, from the Fed, I think they've turned a bit more cautious, um, you know, with evidence from the minutes last night showing that a couple of people, a couple of members might not have um, advocating raising rates at the last meeting. But yet, from these minutes, we also see that they are very open um, to another rate rise. We're expecting one more rate rise at the end before the end of the year from the Fed. Looking at the Bank of England, I think they've got a bit more work to do. Um, obviously, we saw the inflation data come out yesterday yep. um, at 6.8 percent. So that's still quite high compared to, for instance, the US, where it's a lot lower. Let's, let's talk about what comes after the last rate rise. Um, what we're seeing in the bond market at the moment is a bare steepening. So it's it's the belly of the curve, the middle of the curve, the 10 year portion, which is rising, um, flattening out the curve. And that is signaling basically that the market is beginning to believe that higher for longer is now a reality. Is it? Is that going to be, is that going to be the situation that we're ultimately going to have to deal with? Are these economies we're going to roll over? Are they going to have a soft landing? Are rates going to stay higher? Or are these central banks going to be, be suddenly being faced with a recession that they're going to have to cut hard into? Yeah, exactly. Well, of course, there, there are slight differences between every country here. So, for instance, in the UK, in the last meeting from the Bank of England, we did see them warning markets, basically, that they're going to keep rates as high as is necessary to reduce inflation back to that 2% target. And indeed, we're not actually forecasting it to fall um, even to 2.5% um, by the end of 2024. Um, and so it's going to take a long time to come down. Um, yeah, we might still see them start to cut in the UK next year. I think partially because there could be a recession. We are actually forecasting a technical recession in the UK um, in Q4 this year and Q1 next year. So I think the Bank of England has start to, got to be cautious about you know, the impacts on economic demand um, that their high interest rates are having. We're forecasting two more base rate rises, 25 basis point rises from the Bank of England. And that is having a big impact on businesses and consumers. So at some point, they've got to worry about the recession as well as this very high inflation which should start to come down. Josie, the sentiment shift that we've seen, I want to say, in the last month or so when it comes to the bond market is fascinating, as Guy pointed out. I, I'm going to quote uh, Valerie Titel, our, our markets reporter uh, in London, and she basically called this bond market a, a seeing a rejection trade, the idea that if you are dovish too soon or viewed as that, yields are higher, basically asking, or is this it? Is this as far as you're going to go? But Josie, wasn't the criticism a couple of months ago simply that perhaps they are too hawkish for too long? In your opinion, what created the sentiment shift? Well, I think, you know, markets shift strongly in reaction to the data. And a few months back, in particular, for instance, again, in the UK, we were seeing a slew of really worrying data. You know, we're still seeing high wage growth, but higher than expected inflation consistently. Now it's coming in actually at much better rates. And so I think markets have, have softened a bit. But 
we, we've always actually typically um, forecast um, lower rates than, than the markets are suggesting um, because we think the Bank of England will react um, when demand starts to contract in the UK and we are forecasting GDP um, to start coming down. Um, so I think we're usually um, uh, expecting slightly weaker rate rises um, from the Bank of England and also um, sometimes the Fed um, than, than markets are suggesting. And indeed, I think now markets are also adjusting to the fact that central banks are signalling that they will keep interest rates high um, for as long as is necessary because they are worried about this high inflation um, and second round effects from inflation, for instance, fears about a wage price spiral um, with relatively tight labour markets in the UK and the US, um, meaning that you know, we can't allow a wage price spiral um, to, to happen and, and mean that core inflation stays higher for longer um, and so central banks will be reacting to that core inflation data. Well, I'm glad you brought up the wage price spiral argument because, Josie, we had a Callum Pickering on of Berenberg on the show yesterday, and he said, look, the wage price spiral is not necessarily, doesn't apply here simply because wages are lagging inflation rather than leading it. Do you agree? Well, actually, so yesterday, we, uh, sorry, two days ago now, we got, we got that data in the UK that showed actually real wages have return to positive territory um, in the UK. So now wage growth is higher um, than inflation, um, which usually is a good story. Obviously, the cost of living crisis has been driven by the fact um, that wages aren't rising as high as inflation. But now they are, which is good for people's incomes. But there are fears that this could stimulate demand, which itself um, drives inflation. Certainly a lot to digest and a lot of cross currents, which is why I think uh, Guy and I's minds are kind of spinning at what the bond market is doing. Josie Anderson of the Center for Economics and Business Research, we thank you as always for joining the program this morning. Uh, we stick with the economic story because former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers warned that the U.S. needs to be careful, specifically in its approach to China. He spoke with Bloomberg's David Weston. It's two-edged. Uh, it's good when your customer prospers and it's bad when your competitor gets hyper efficient. So it's a two edged uh, thing. I am concerned that we will become the object of China's frustration and that will tempt them to uh, lash out. I think we need to be very careful uh, in our approach uh, to China at uh, a moment of this kind of difficulty. And we need to be more attentive than I think some of the policy advocates in Washington are to avoiding a situation where we terrify uh, China with the potential economic damage that we're going to do to them. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers there talking about the impact from China. Look, we've talked about monetary policy. We've talked about the geopolitics. Let's talk now about the consumer. Coming up, more retail results rolling in with Walmart on deck today. We're going to discuss what to expect next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with North Dakota Governor and Presidential Candidate Doug Burgum. Coming up at 5 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Three minutes past the app. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. It's the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London. Kuri Gupta, of course, in New York. I've been talking about this all morning, Kuri, so let's try and get some details on what I see is happening here. Uh, the fintech company, Adyen, resuming trading, but look at what is going on. Uh, this after... Uh, it's, so it was down 25%. It got halted. We're now down 28%. It's falling like a brick. Uh, joining us now to discuss this is Bloomberg Sarah Jacob. Sarah, why is the market reacting as violently as we are seeing on the screen in front of us. What do we learn from these results? Well, Adyen reported earnings in the first half that missed estimates on revenue and margins. It posted its slowest net revenue growth since it was listed. Um, and at, it attributed this to a weaker economic climate with higher interest rates, inflation, and particularly increased price competition in North America. 
Uh, the company has also continued to hire this year, which is weighed on its margins. Sarah, walk us through why their revenue growth slowed so much in the first place. Yeah, um, Adyen has said that growth slowed particularly in North America. Now, North America accounts for a quarter of the company's net revenue, um, and it's said that it's been facing increased competition in this market. Uh, the company said that with high inflation and interest rates, digital uh, customers in the U.S. have been focusing more on profitability and costs than growth, and, and that's, that's impacted their net revenue growth. What, what, can I, what can I read into the bigger picture here? This is a company that has Uber as a client, McDonald's, Henners and Mauritz, Spotify. Is there anything I can take away from what Adyen's saying about what is happening more broadly within those businesses as well? Well, the company uh, doesn't really specify about uh, the long term and, and how consumer spending is happening, but it does say that uh, customers in uh, in the U.S. are focusing and more on you know cost optimization. So that's one point to think about. Um, at the same time, you know, Adyen has continued to hire while a lot of its peers have announced job cuts. Adyen has said it's an investment mode and it's preparing for its next growth phase. It hired about 1,200 employees last year and is committed to hiring a similar amount this year. Uh, in the first half, we've already seen that they've hired about 550 employees. Um, so uh, Adyen also uh, reaffirmed its forecast for long-term EBITDA margins, and um, it has said it will slow the pace of hiring from next year. Sarah Jacob in Amsterdam covering that story for us. And of course, as we speak, the shares are down about 26%. It was halted for volatility. Now looks like it has resumed trading. Uh, let's get to another major story coming up this morning. Walmart reporting earnings. The shares higher by about eight tenths of 1% in the pre-market. The retailer's outlook on the holiday season, back to school shopping, among other things, all in focus. Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg's resident consumer reporter, Simone Foxman. Simone, walk us through what we're actually expecting from Walmart today. Well, Walmart is doing better than ever, and that's really the key difference between uh, its shares and its rivals. If we back this chart out uh, just a little bit, we'll see that Costco is close to an all uh, close to a record high since early 2022. But Walmart shares actually earlier this week um, hit a record high, and they're up about 12 percent this year. Expectations very high for what we uh, are expecting from Walmart. We're looking for comp stores uh, sales, X Gas up about four percent. But I think the whisper number a little bit higher here. JP Morgan, Evercore ISI expecting a beat and a raise. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you look at our analyst uh, outlooks generally, 38 buy suggestions, eight holds, only one sell. Um, okay, let's talk about what we're actually going to get and where we should be looking. Simone, where should I be focusing in the business to kind of look for the, for the critical information? Which parts of the business am I going to be watching? It's got a much bigger grocery business than Target. Is that where I should be focusing or elsewhere? Yeah, the chart might have given it away. Grocery business is the one to watch. We've seen a dramatic run up in the grocery sales and then they came down just a little bit last quarter. Now, part of this is we may be seeing a weaker consumer. Part of this is simply that uh, grocery inflation has really kind of topped off. So we could see some differences in the, in the comps uh, that are a little bit challenging. This is 51% of Walmart's business. Yes, much larger than Target's, which is about 20%. This has helped insulate the company from some of the effects of that weakening consumer. But remember, it is a low margin business. And so that could weigh on overall margins. Uh, we will see if we see weaker than expected numbers here, that could be a pretty negative signal for the stock. Walmart does a million and one different things. You go there for groceries. If you're a new kind of college uh, student, you go there for kind of dorm accessories even. You go there for fuel if you're on the go. And then, of course, there's their entire e-commerce business. Expectations are high across the board. Where could there be some surprises? You know, if we were looking for an upside surprise here, we could see it in Walmart Plus. You mentioned their e-commerce business. They've really been investing here. I mean, and you check out what's happened in the last couple of years. Very strong pandemic era online sales, e-commerce growth. But we've seen that tick 
uh, uh, substantially higher in the last couple of quarters. They've really been investing there. Really interesting note out from Bloomberg Intelligence talking about what happens when people sign up for this premium subscription, Walmart Plus. They limit their transactions on Amazon at that point, and they also cut back from other grocers. So this could be a real area of strength for the company. If we saw a bit of commentary around this, that is something that could surprise to the upside if we see strong numbers. Certainly something we're going to be watching very closely. Simone Foxman covering that for us throughout the morning. We thank you as always. We are getting some breaking news. A big theme in the last two weeks or so has been simply consolidation in the steel sector. Now it looks like another company uh, kind of making another bid for tech resources specifically. Now JSW, uh, the Indian conglomerate, said to seek partners to bid for about 75% of tech resources coal unit. Now here's why this is important. We know that tech resources broadly, not just their coal unit, had got an initial offer from Glen. Core. Then Glencore said, actually, we're going to focus in on that uh, coal, the steel making coal business specifically, spin it out. And they'd offered about $8 billion to do that. Now, back in July, Bloomberg News had reported that JSW, again, this massive Indian tech uh, steel conglomerate, was going to go for about 20% of the company. Now's news that might go for 75. We're going to bring you all the updates as we get them. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Guy Johnson in London. Let's get a quick check of some of the stocks we're watching in pre-market trading in the U.S. Of course, we are on earnings watch. And Cisco reporting earnings after the bell yesterday. Higher in the pre-market, almost 3%, $54.50 a share for our radio audience. Uh, this is coming after a really big expected kind of slowdown in their sales unit, Guy. Essentially, this is a company that has a lot of business exposure. If you are concerned about a slowdown in the broader economy, the first people that are going to pull back are your business, your corporate investors, and it doesn't yeah. look like that slowdown has really materialized. The market was anticipating that that was going to be happening as a result of which it had priced it in. We didn't get it. That's why you get the pop. What is it, up 3% this morning? So I think the message here is not as bad as feared. Doesn't necessarily paint a that positive a picture, but it could have been worse, I think, is the message. I think that's kind of the, the vibe of the entire market right now, that things could actually be worse and they're not as bad as they could be. Therefore, let's buy into the market, which is, I got to say, an interesting uh, dynamic in terms of the sustainability argument. Speaking of sustainability, let's talk about crypto a little bit and perhaps where the gains are there. Regulatory story moving two major stocks this morning. Coinbase Global down by about nine-tenths of one percent and PayPal down as well, seven-tenths of one percent. Now, Coinbase, for two different reasons, was uh, given basically approval that they could offer U.S. futures for some of their cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin specifically, for their retail-based access. Now, it created a pop in the shares yesterday, a little bit of a pullback today. PayPal, on the other hand, suspending some of their U.K. offerings because, again, that R word, regulatory approvals. It's tricky. I, I think Coinbase has been working on that for about a couple of years now. It, it takes, uh, I think the, the, my takeaway from this once again is that it takes a lot longer. You get a lot of excitement, you're anticipating things are going to change, and it takes a lot longer for things to change. And, and you can see this ac across the entire crypto universe. A and you also have the different regulatory stories which companies have so often in the, in the last sort of year or so fall, fall and foul off. You get one regulatory environment, you get another, they overlap. Can U.S. investors trade in this or vice versa? Yeah. It's an incredibly confusing picture. It really is. And look, when you talk about the regulatory approval, remember uh, the likes of BlackRock and Vanguard are already talking to the likes of SEC, for example, about how the ETF yep. world factors into that. Guy, I'm going to leave you with last one, last one here. Paramount moving this morning as well. P-A-R-A. -A. Now, look, it looks unchanged in the morning, but it has been moving quite a bit. I think this morning when I checked about an hour ago, is down six-tenths of one percent. So volatility baked into that stock as we talk about them potentially holding on to their stake in BET. There was a lot yeah. of speculation about how they were going to spin that off, and it looks like they don't plan to anymore. They're basically saying it's not going to have a material impact on their balance sheets. They're not going to do it. However, Paramount is dead center in terms of the debate around where the consolidation is going to come. It definitely fits into a lot of people's expectations. Yeah, a, a lot to digest without through all the media industry. That does it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.